Hello everyone and welcome to a week discussion on The Jungle by Upton Sinclair chapters 1 through 4. So as mentioned in other parts of the syllabus, this course features a weekly discussion presentation or act of leading discussion that is posted by students and the instructors online the week before class. So what does this mean? For me as your instructor, it means I have to be reading ahead of you, bringing my thoughts together, and creating this piece to help structure your thinking and your reading so that you can have engagement with the text and not just this moment of trying to figure out what happens, which is of course part of the work, but we wanna go beyond comprehension. We wanna go beyond figuring out the plot to thinking further about what's happening on the page, what's happening across the text, and Welcome to the Week is a way for us to do that and, of course, share our voices across the classroom. So I am doing video versions of this. Moving forward, as you all will sign up to do a Welcome to the Week video, you'll be choosing to do either videos using Zoom or perhaps maybe creating an extended blog post to help guide your peers through discussion. Both options are available. Um, both options are equally as good. It's just a matter of, do you want to write it all down or do you want to create something that people can move through visually and through media as well? It's all up to you. And there's also the option of doing a kind of combination of both. Okay, so now let's think about a couple of terms to help us consider the work as a whole, but also consider how Upton Sinclair is blending both a very traditional form, the novel, and muckraking, which was a form of investigative and journalism that occurred in the late 19th and early 20th century. Muckraking tried to really delve into those social issues that needed attendance, whether it was big business taking too much control, a lack of uh, support for immigrants, different forms of crime, what have you. Muckraking wanted to dig up the filth of society so that we could better address it in our modern era. The novel, on the other hand, is long form and intended to show us the panorama of social life. So in some ways, these two things kind of work together. Novels show us social life, but then muckraking helps us think about how can we improve it or what are the challenges of social life. Again, the form is a novel, the genre is muckraking, and the style well, the style is going to involve realism. So let's think more about these terms. So a novel gives us the social panorama of life. And from the beginning, we're definitely getting a panorama of the family that Jurgis and Ona are forming on their wedding day. In the first chapter, we have this huge feast and all these details, the food, the surroundings, the interactions. And what I want us to consider is, how do these details add up? What effect do they have? What kind of feeling or mood do they provide? What kind of expectations do they set up for us? And considering the sheer fact that this is a novel that will focus on meatpacking and the social ills or challenges that the immigrant workforce faces in America at the turn of the 19th century, we also got to consider if this is a novel that's all about the social issues, why start with the wedding? Why start with this celebratory moment? What does this wedding tell us about class? What does this wedding tell us about family? How does this wedding invite us into the social world or panorama? But also, how does it provide a setup for the muckraking or social ills that will continue to be unpacked and explored? Then there's realism. Realism is a word we hear all the time, and our associations usually do point us in the right direction. William Dean Howells, um, an early writer in American society or theorizer of realism, really thought realism was about getting the near at hand. So instead of this idea bias, lofty, heroic storyline that's far away from us, we want to get to the nitty gritty. What are people actually like? How they interact with one another? How do people have distinctive characteristics that are associated with their cultural settings, but also with their sociology, or excuse me, psychology? And then finally here, scooting myself to cover up our citation for just a moment. What speaks to you as an example of realism in a novel? So I bring up another figure, Thomas Sargent Perry, because 
he had a slightly different perspective from Howells in the sense that he thought realism also involves capturing all the little incidents, less of a focus or less of the novel being centralized by the plot alone. So what does this mean for our own thinking? As we're reading through the jungle, do we think the series of events are crafted to produce a very particular narrative plot, or are they part of capturing that panorama of the experience? Are we looking for a moment where plot stands out the most, or is it the incidents themselves and the sufferings and actions and qualities of characters that become paramount? These are two different forms or two different ways of defining realism, and therefore going to be two different ways for us to think through what's happening through the novel. And I invite you all in the comments and of course in class discussion to consider what speaks to you as an example of realism so far. What passage, what instance, what word, what makes us think this is a realistic piece? And then following up on that, what is the effect? Or if we don't know the effect right away, how can we keep track of these details to get a larger understanding of the novel as a whole? And just as I mentioned in the first day of class, tracking those smaller things help us develop patterns. Patterns help us develop arguments for essays. So one aspect of the realism in the novel that I find interesting is the code switch switching or hearing immigrant life in the Lithuanian language. Luckily for us, with our particular text that's offered through standard ebooks, we can click on the footnotes and find out what the translation for this language. But at the same time, imagine what it would be like to read this text in its own moment, to capture snippets of sound that actually tell us who, and we, who is speaking or where we are within the city. So language, especially when it is untranslated, can become an aspect of realism it also will become an aspect of how we understand what the family goes through as they navigate their lives within the Chicago meat packing district. As I mentioned earlier, another aspect of that realism is going to be cultural. So I want to think here about the traditional Lithuanian wedding party. What does it mean for characters as a whole and individually? What does the wedding party set up? These are things for us to think about. And of course, I pulled a passage from the text featured here. Um, I can't provide you with exact page numbers because we're working with an electronic or digital copy, but this is in chapter one, and this is a passage we might return to, to think about the wedding feast or its importance or what it brings to our story. I think one thing that caught my attention when I picked out this second passage was how this is a once in a lifetime event. So even as there's this fear about the money and the excess of the food and the celebration, there's also this understanding of the humanity here. How do we sort of celebrate and connect? And especially for this group of immigrants, how do they celebrate and connect within the context of America? One way of doing that is by having that wedding here, by having that wedding and holding on to those moments in spite of all the hassles that may incur afterwards. Another thing to think about that happens throughout the text that's less centric to realism, but another aspect of the reading is the use of the second person point of view. How often does our narrator say, you, reader, come in, you, reader, recognize this thing, recognize this aspect of the city, here's something you might not know about. Is there a kind of relationship between the fact that this is a novel that is intended to investigate and the fact that it solicits you, the reader, to come into this world. Something for us to think about in the comments and something to think about as we continue to move through the text. This all, in fact, plays into the fact, excuse me, a little redundant there, this all plays into the fact that this is a serialized novel. So when it was originally published, the jungle was broken into different serialized pieces or smaller accounts. These smaller accounts or these chapters one at a time were intended to keep readers to returning to find out what happened to Yerkes, what happened to Ona. So it's not just about moving through the piece, but also keeping people engaged with the story, especially if they may not have the previous week's chapters or they may not have one large text all at once. So how might the fact 
that this is broken up, along with the fact that we have our author saying, you, the reader, soliciting us, bringing us in, shape our reading of the novel in distinct ways. And then finally, just as a recap, what is the jungle? It's a novel. It's muckraking. It's realistic. It's serialized. And it features a narrator, Jurgis and Ona, as it should say here, a reader slash you. In the last moments of this video, I want to bring your attention to a couple of thematic points of return related to gender and labor, space, place, and living. So in chapter two, we hear over and over again how Jurgis is a big man, quite literally. He is strong, he is powerful, and for these reasons, he's not worried about being able to do the work to provide for his family. As he says at one point, with arms such as these, with these arms, how could he be worried about doing anything? He'll always be able to work because he has the body and the strength to do so. With this body, with this strength, and with this labor, Jurgis is also trying to navigate or find a home for his family. And they're trying to find a home in the city. The city is specifically Chicago, but Chicago is more than just a place. It's a space that becomes almost a compass for them, guiding them until they get there, at which point the way they navigate becomes more intricate and more complicated, especially as they start looking for a home. So I want you to think about why is the city idealized? What does it allow the characters to imagine? But then going one step further, we have the tenement that kind of crushes some of the dreams or at least brings them into a stark reality. So these are images from tenements in Chicago. Oh, and this image actually is out of frame. Let's see if I can get some more back in frame. I cannot. Hold on one moment. So this is an image from the New York City Tenement Museum, um, a place we will hopefully get to go to th this semester. So what I want you to bear in mind is that spaces are small, windows are rare, and so having these like railroad style houses, everything sort of connecting to a room with a window open was very important. There are lots of concerns about being able to get the light to come through and the air to come through, especially if there's limited electricity. Another image that helps us think about this is featured here. Again, having as many windows inside of rooms so that the air could get from one side to another. And these are the kind of details I want you to pay attention to, especially when we're considering what are the implications of space, place, and living. And finally, I would like to close with a question that could be advanced into a possible essay question. Space, place, and understanding how people live. What are the relationships between, excuse me, again, slight typo here. Hopefully you all won't have as many. But what are the relation, what is the relationship between the city and the stockyard and the tenement? Where do these characters imagine their lives? Where do they live? What characterizes these spaces? What I want to emphasize here is an attendance to the environment and also class, labor, and social systems. I bring these words together because we don't often think about cities as environments, but if we do so, how do we sort of appreciate the way we describe the material, um, the size of a room, how much furniture, the quality of the air, how warm it is, how cold it is. These are aspects of a human ecology that are important and define the way we live. So what is Upton Sinclair up to when he does this kind of work, attending to the details surrounding the lives of Jurgis and his family? Thank you for watching this video. Please feel free to write at least one comment or more. And of course, as always, think about these questions as they might help advance you towards a larger essay topic or something you want to return to in your own blog post or your own sort of reflection as we have our experiential experiences in the city but also continue conversations in the classroom. Thank you.